What's up, everybody? Episode 576 of Get Paid for Your Pad. Well, today is a very special episode. I know I, I say that almost every episode that it's special, but today is a super special episode because my guest is the one and only Mr. Josefa Capadia, who is not only the co-author of Get Paid for Your Pad, he was also the co-host of this very podcast in the beginning when we got started with it uh, almost, uh, what is it, almost, yeah, nine years ago, crazy. Uh, yeah. And he's also the inventor, singer, and composer of the famous Get Paid for Your Pad intro tune the intro tune that's so, that many people love many people hate but uh it's uh it's <laughs> super catchy um so Huseva, welcome to the show man get paid for your pad get <laughs> paid for your pad i still remember yeah uh thank you thank you well uh glad to be here obviously and uh happy belated birthday to you yeah Good thanks night. yeah so me and Josefa, we were just in uh, mexico uh, with my wife as well. The three of us were down there for three days to celebrate my birthday, which was on Monday. Yeah. Um, so we had a, yeah, we had a great time. Um, since I live in, in San Diego, it's very easy to go to Mexico. You literally just cross the border, which it's a pretty funny experience actually walking across the border. I've, ne I've never done that before in my life. And usually it's like by plane or train or it's a fun experience, wasn't it? Same. Yeah. It was a trip walking by foot and, you know, I was a little nervous at first and, but it was totally safe and it was, it was just, it was a really cool experience. So yeah, the whole trip was awesome. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. So the, the reason that uh, I wanted to invite Josefa back on the show, first of all, as a special episode for kind of for my birthday and us spending time together, uh, you know, we started this journey together and it's been an amazing journey for the last uh, nine years, but also Josefa, um, you know, I think we worked together for like a year or so on this podcast. And then Josefa actually started his own math tutoring business. He quit his, uh, his job as a lawyer, started uh, running his own business. And he's been extremely successful uh, with, with this business that he started. And, you know, it's just been an amazing journey for me to kind of watch uh, Josefa like grow. There was a lot of obstacles in the beginning, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of, a lot of doubts and, you know, a lot of challenges, but now he's, he's absolutely crushing it. It's unbelievable. Uh, so I'm, I'm really, really impressed with, uh, with what you built and I uh, thought it would be cool to kind of share your, your journey of what you've been doing and, uh, and also like share some advice of the things that you've learned of like leaving your corporate job and jumping into your own business. I know there's a lot of people in our community that, uh, are, Airbnb hosts and they have a full-time job, uh, but a lot of people want to do full-time SDRs and there's a lot of challenges with, uh, you know, with quitting a full-time job and jumping into that. So, but, uh, but yeah, Josefa, why don't you, why don't you share kind of like your, your story of, uh, s s you know, since you started your, uh, your tutoring business, uh, Scalar Learning. Yes. Uh, happy to love, love th talking about the story and sort of like reliving it. And I should do that more often. You know, I, uh, I was just listening uh, somebody was talking about the fact that just we tend to be not as grateful as we 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 necessarily could be. Maybe there's a balance, right? You don't want to just all the time sit back and reflect, but uh, you also want to look forward and think about what you're trying to achieve and whatnot. And uh, but but that gratitude, I think it it is important every so often to reflect back and be like, man, this has been a pretty pretty cool journey. So I'd love to do that. So let's let's go back, and I'm going to try my best because it's a long story, but I'm going to try my best to keep it brief. And then uh, in any areas that you want to further explore, you just let me know, and we can dive deeper. But goes back to really since I graduated law school in 2009 because I had a pretty set path in my mind of working in, I have a background in computer science and economics from University of Michigan. Then I went to law school, graduated from Northwestern in 2009, Northwestern School of Law. And the objective was at that point with my software background and my now law degree, patent law was the obvious choice. Super hot field, probably still is. Um, and I'd, I'd gotten a position at what I consider to be the premier IP firm in the country, uh, Finnegan, and I was super excited about that. So go to DC, think everything is set. Now I'm going to try and make partner. Boom, boom, boom. My life is, is set out. And then what I found was that even though I, I, I loved the firm, it was an amazing firm and, and the, the, the people were great. There were so many elements that were great. The compensation was excellent. And th so these were all things that were kind of new to me, the, um, this type of compensation, this type of a cushy job. So it was very attractive. But what I realized intrinsically was that the work I was doing it just wasn't hitting my natural strengths. And by the way, I would, a lot of folks 
really tend to complain of when they're in big law corporate it just it's just that way i think because there's a disconnect between what people imagine the the position to be like and the work like and what it actually is so there's a lot of people that are unhappy i wouldn't say i was unhappy i just felt like there was something else for, for me that would just really hit my natural strengths as opposed to sitting in an office uh, and reading and doing paperwork like that so i started thinking what is something that i always gravitate towards and just where I can just be me, you know, and everything's going to flow naturally. And I did some work with a, a career coach. We kind of made a list of the things that I would do for free if I could. Um, and there were two things at the top of that list. One was tutoring math because I've always loved it. And I've, it's always come super naturally to me. Uh, and the other was working with dogs. And I chose the former in, in terms of starting a business. And that was the other, the, the, the other component was over the, I practiced law for four years. Okay, I started at that firm that I also lateral to Los Angeles to another firm in LA. And I worked there for a year and a half. And I kept, uh, you know, th throughout that time, I, m I was thinking maybe maybe I could transition into something else, maybe it would be cool to start a business, I started getting hungry for that. But it was really scary, you know, because if you I was in big law, and if you leave big law, there's really no coming back. I mean, there, it can be, but it, it can be quite difficult. So you're essentially throwing away this trajectory of almost like guaranteed really high income, you know, down the line. So it was tough. Um, but once I kind of went through that process and made certain that this, this was just going to be, this was going to be really naturally aligned with my skills and my strengths and my inclinations and, and what makes me have fun. And you you add that to all the support I had from people like like Jasper. You you were probably one of the most instrumental in that. Um, so a, a lot of my other really close friends helped give me just that support. That like yeah, dude, you're you actually can pull this off. It, it's not as crazy as it sounds. And that gave me the the courage to eventually be like, okay, boom, because I didn't dip my toe in. I basically um, I quit full stop because I was like, if I'm going to build this business, I need full attention because. How can you building a business seems so difficult? How can I do it in, in like the evenings and stuff like that if I'm if I'm working? And that was it. So that was the beginning. That's how I made the jump. Uh, and by the way, jump in because uh, that that's just how I got to it. Uh, if you have a, if you have a question, if not, I'll keep rolling through the next phase. Yeah, I think uh, you know. I think one thing that we can go a little little deeper into is. It walk us through the process of the decision making process and like kind of the emotional roller coaster as well in you know making that decision of of quitting your your job and going full into into your business like what were kind of the the things that came up for you and how did you kind of where did you find the courage to kind of make that decision okay so yeah it was a it was a multi step process. I remember the first thing I started, I, I love self, self-help and self-development books. And actually at this point though, I wasn't, I did, I wasn't so into it as I am now, uh, as I was a few years later, right? Then I started getting really into it. Um, but I did, I was trying to figure this out. It's like the first, the first question I had was, okay, if this current position doesn't really align with what I consider to be my natural strengths. Like, for example, I love math, I love computations. And I felt like that wasn't really a part of my job, just, you know, as a patent attorney It was more, hey, I'm reading case law, I'm uh, helping uh, draft motions for certain things in, you know, within a lawsuit, I, I was occasionally taking depositions, which was really fun. But anyways, the point is, is a lot of my skills, my really natural, uh, strong skills were not being utilized. So I said, okay, how can I figure out what this job? So first, I wasn't even thinking starting my own business. What job might exist out there that would be a nice catch-all for the things that I like to do naturally? So I started reading books. There's one book that always people laugh when I say this. It's called The Unhappy Lawyer. So I read that. I read um, other books about, hey, how do you kind of figure out what a, what a perfect job might be? And I remember in The Unhappy Lawyer in particular – one of the things I was trying to do is I was like, if I can just reason it out and much, I'll find this perfect job and I'll go. And it made the point of, which I thought was a really nice point, is that uh, you're not really going to know unless you try it. So you kind of, you, you can't overanalyze it, but you can start thinking, you can maybe try something, make a mistake, try again. And that really was the first step in, in liberating me a bit in terms of, okay, I can, I can kind of brainstorm a little bit, come up with some ideas and maybe see what happens. Anyway, so I, I was reading these books and, and thinking it through. 
Um, and then I would go back and forth too with that massive opportunity cost of three years of law school, so expensive, right? And you have this like really set path. So it's a lot of things like this. Uh, one of the one of the other really helpful elements in terms of crossing that mental barrier, an emotional barrier, really, of how can I give up all this and then try something that's really unproven was getting to know so many people that had done similar things like Jasper, arbitrage trader, and then jump ship and sort of did all these all these really cool, interesting, different things. Uh, I have a lot of other close friends and slow and like that, that I started meeting and, and building connections with are like, Oh my God. Like, so they have, so this is possible. People have done stuff like this. And that's another point in the unhappy lawyer is that if you're just surrounding yourself with all other attorneys in my case, right. And you start talking about this of like, Hey, I'm thinking about totally shifting gears and, and starting a new career path. Most of them are going to look at you and think that's just not a smart idea, not out of malice, but it just doesn't sound like a smart idea when you're in, in that world, you know, and you've got this kind of thing that's laid out for you perfectly. Why, why are you throwing it away? Why are you risking it? So uh, that really helped in terms of making me feel more comfortable and more safe. And like, this is actually, this is actually a doable thing. Yeah. Yeah. Let me jump in here real quick. Cause like one of the things that I remember from when I quit my own job was, um, there, a, a lot of times, like when you ask friends and family for advice, they're going to, they're going to recommend the safest option. Right. And I think it's not because they don't want the best for you, but, or they do want the best for you. They just think that's the best thing for you to do. But also, you know, it's like when you recommend something that's kind of like the risk of your option and it doesn't, doesn't kind of pan out, you know, you feel kind of bad, like going back of like, damn, like I, sh I shouldn't have told them that, right. I shouldn't have. I should have told them don't do it right so you know that's something that i noticed where a lot of people will just advise to to take the safe route um so for me what what really helped was really kind of seeking out the people that were supportive of of my decision you know and just kind of surrounding myself with those people um because that you know it's all it's easier to do something where you're supported obviously i think that yes the support too and then <clears throat> here's the other thing if I think, and this was something that I think my parents eventually saw and were like, oh, this actually was a great decision because of what I'm about to say. If you say, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to switch it up and I'm going to try something else just in, just in and of itself, you make that statement. You're like, man, this looks like a real uphill battle and you're, you know, the odds are going to be stacked against you. Why? It doesn't make sense. And that's just a norm. That, that would be a standard, normal positive piece of advice that this is this is probably not a good idea. But if you could instead say, and you can feel certain about this, this is the key. If instead you're saying, listen, I'm going to put this away and I'm going to go full on on this brand new thing. But I promise you that as I do this, I'm going to be working between 80 and 100 hours a week and spending every ounce of my energy towards this one objective to being the best at this one thing. Uh, and and so I know I'm going to master it because I'm going to be obsessive over it. If people, if like, if you could legitimately say that and people could see that and have some idea of, of the amount of effort you're going to put in, then I think it wouldn't seem so crazy to most people, but it's like, you don't even know to some degree other are like, you might know, but other people around you are not going to know that that's, you're going to give it that amount of effort. And I think that usually when it kind of doesn't work out ideally, or you back away and you decide to go back to what you're doing before something like that. Um, I think it's usually because that full effort can't get unlocked for whatever reason. It might also be because you chose something that doesn't allow you to pour everything into. For example, for me, the reason why this, it almost seemed um, and not not easy, but it se it didn't seem like oh my god, such an effort every day to put in all this time because I just fell in love with all these different elements of the business. A lot of them I I put I forced into the business because it's, I was like, well, it's my business and these are things that I love. So I'm going to make math music videos because I love music and I love math and I I don't care if it if it has an amazing ROI, I'm going to do it. So it's like forcing these things into the model just because I'm like this is such a blast. It wasn't hard to to pour everything into it and give it such an effort. So it almost is like when you when you do that, when you commit to a commitment like that, man, the odds just skyrocket in your favor. So let's uh, let's look at your business when you started. I think it was 2013 
Was it yeah. when you when you started tutoring? I remember you were using this platform called Wisent. Yep. This was the time when all these sharing economy platforms were kind of popping up, you know, like Airbnb and Turo and like, you know, like there was so many different sharing economy platforms and Wisent was one of them. W yes. Walk us through like how you started nine years ago and what your business looks like right now. 10 years ago, 10, 10 years, years ago, ago now. Isn't that crazy? The, a full decade. Yeah. So the, the interesting thing about a tutoring business that I like, because I'm not just starting a tutoring business and hiring tutors and doing the managerial side. That was never my intention. I want to be on the ground, in the trenches, do, because that's, the, that's one of the pieces that I love so much is working with kids and explaining this, this concept that can cause so much anxiety and be like, hey, I'm going to clear it up for you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the, the negativity go away and make you feel empowered to do this. So I was like, hey, the great thing about this business is I'm going to start just by being a tutor myself, building my reputation, trying to get become the best that I can be at this. Uh, and really the best in the world has kind of always been my objective. Now, I started out just in LA, uh, quitting, my, quitting my job <clears throat> and saying, all right, how can I get clients? And I didn't know anybody in the school systems. I grew up in Michigan, right? So I had no connections out here, nothing. <clears throat> Somebody had mentioned this platform, Wisant. Uh, actually, there's a friend of mine from law school. He's like, hey, you know, I know you're starting this business. Why don't you check it out? There was also uh, another website called care.com. People had said, hey, put, I put up flyers. I reached out to friends, family. I also emailed a, a, a bunch of schools at the beginning uh, just being like, hey, can I get a meeting? 300 schools probably plus that I emailed. Hey, can I get a meeting? Can I get it? Uh, I, I, I just like to introduce myself. I'm new on the scene. Um, out of those emails, I got uh, five responses. Um, and then I ended up, or maybe 10 responses, but five meetings. I remember that. So I met with them and kind of that led to some interesting opportunities as well, by the way, that were very, very important in my journey. But um, going back to what you mentioned, I also jumped on Wisent. Eventually, it was, it, it was a few months in, let's say. Wisent was very interesting because it, it was, at this point, it was pretty, it was somewhat on the newer side. But it took a, it, it basically empowered solo tutors like me to get on a marketplace and show ourselves as opposed to, you know, so we could compete with these larger companies, let's say Kaplan or Princeton Review, these test prep companies like that, that had this uh, uh, name, established name, right? And just like on Airbnb or these other platforms, you get reviews for each session. You get people can also write reviews, stuff like that. So super cool. And I started there uh, uh, and I wasn't getting anybody because I had no reviews at the beginning. I had nothing. So the, I was like, you know what? Um, I, I just need experience and I need people to say what, what they think about me. And that's the way that I'm going to start getting clients. Well, in order to get the reviews and get all the stuff, I'm going to drop my price as low as I can imagine. Just undercut everybody. So I dropped it to $20 an hour. And Wisant takes a percentage. I think at that time it was like 20%. So really you're getting $16, $16 an hour is, is essentially what I was effectively getting paid. So I dropped it to that and it worked. And I started getting, getting clients. And that was the beginning of building my sort of brand on Wisent. Then people kept leaving the five stars, five stars, um, writing some really nice reviews for me. And it took about a year and a half, but I'd say about a year and a half of building this brand on Wisent, all of a sudden it started hitting. And, and it was a while, but then it started hitting and I started getting a nice flow of clients from that. And by the way, by this point, I'd like steadily raise my prices. So I'm like, okay, now I think I can raise it to 30. Now I think I can raise it to 40 to 50. It was almost in those $10 increments. Like literally I had, I had, there was a point where I was at 40. There was a point where I was at 50, 60, 70, 80. Okay. Uh, and that was that side. Then simultaneously I was, as I was sort of, and then there was a point where I was the top tutor in LA on Wisant. So you'd search math tutor in LA and I was number one that had come up. And by that point, I think I'd raise it to like 120 or 150, something like that. But simultaneously, I was also doing my thing with the LA schools. And that one, one of the, those five meetings ended up being huge because she was so nice. She had her own school in Hollywood, took the time to meet me and everything. And just of her own, just to help me so sweet. She connected me with a gentleman who actually was a teacher, but also had a tutoring company, was a teacher at this amazing school, elementary school in the Palisades. And 
Through that, I got brought in to a standardized test program at the school. Then I eventually started meeting families that way. So I was also, it's like I was building my rep on Wizen. On one side and the other side, I was getting to net- network and know all these families that were interested in math tutoring, got to know me, got to know how I taught. Um, and throughout this time too, I'm just getting better. I'm getting better and better because I'm always, I'm thinking constantly about how to communicate the best, how to how to um, just be the best teacher, how to learn not just three ways to teach a single concept, but five ways, six ways, seven ways, so I can connect with different learning styles, et cetera. Um, so all of this was, was kind of how I started to build my little baseline of clients. And then once it reached a critical mass, then people started uh, uh, kind of spreading the word and, and I just started getting word of mouth referrals. The one funny thing that I will say that's interesting if you're trying to start a tutoring business in particular, one thing that I didn't anticipate, which is kind of funny, is because you're a limited resource. Now, it's not like at this point, I didn't have anybody else. It was just me. And so when people would work with me, and let's say we're doing especially academic tutoring, where I'm going to almost become a part of their regimen every week, there is a hesitancy to refer you out because if they if if a family decides let's say they want to work with me long term referring me out might make my schedule more compact it might make me raise my prices theoretically right so and 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 I totally understood this like there was no I wasn't like upset about it but I understood there was sometimes a reluctance to refer me out because parents feared feared that that, that might happen that might take away some of the attention I was able to give to their kids in particular so this was a barrier and I had, I knew that this was happening. And I, some kids, some of my students actually said, had told me point blank, you know, Hey, but you know, we don't really talk about you to other people because of that, of that issue. I was like, wow, that's interesting. I never thought about that as a, as a barrier to growth. Um, and then for me, the, the way that I broke through that is, it's really comes down to a handful of clients that I have that are super, super close to me and near and dear to my heart. And I love them. And they, they know that, uh, or I hope they know that. Uh, I've tried to make sure that I, I explain how appreciative I, have the, I am of them because it's like the, this handful of clients were like, told me basically straight up. Yeah, I know some people don't maybe refer you out, this and that, but I don't care if you, if, if, this, if this, I don't care about that. I want to help you. Uh, I want to see you succeed and just referred me out like crazy. And then that's that was around, I think, 2017, maybe, um, where my client list just really took off. Uh, and now we have like over 200 students uh, that are in, you know, part of the scalar learning team and stuff like that. Back back then it was, you know, it was much smaller, but still it was sub- substantial, you know, 25, 30 kids. It's a lot, you know, for one for one person. So uh, explain a little bit more about what your business looks like now. Like you have 200 students, but now you also have your own tutors, right? You have a whole team of tutors now. Like, well, yeah, what does your business look like right now? Okay. Well, another another huge component of the business is YouTube. Okay. Uh, we I started the YouTube channel in 2016. And that was, I was reluctant to, you know, to get into any of this social media stuff. I just, it wasn't my thing, but we... I kept going to conferences for these online learning platforms like Udemy and everybody just kept saying, you got to create a, you have to have social media. You have to have social media. Okay, fine. So I started a YouTube channel and over the years, right now we're up to, we just passed 70,000 subscribers, which is amazing. I'd like to think, um, I I do firmly believe that when we're talking about ACT math and SAT math, we're the best. Uh, And, and um, we have a we so we have a, a bunch of walkthrough videos for for standardized test practice tests where I'm solving it in real time. We have critical concept videos. We even have the math music videos. We have everything. Um, right now we're adding in also curriculum math as well, which I'm really excited about. But so now dates so that has grown as well, and that's ended up being a, a lead magnet as well. We get clients from YouTube that there's so many people that we help globally. Um, you know, we've generated over like 8 million views or something close to that right now. So we're helping people for free all over the world, which is amazing. But then also people who want additional help, additional tutoring, they see the quality of the videos, they see the quality of the help and if they want more, they come to us. And then I either work with them personally or somebody on my team will then work with them for various price points. So now I would say, if you take all that stuff in, my time is split between 
of course, I'm first and foremost, I'm a math tutor. That's my, that's what I love. That's my title. That's what defines me, I would say, uh, most accurately. So I spend during the school year 50 to 60 hours a week um, doing private tutoring. So I have a lot of clients and I have a very busy workload. So my, my schedule's crazy. You know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday, I'm tutoring a ton. Sunday's my busiest day. You know, I usually do somewhere between like 12 and 14 hours of tutoring. And and then Fridays are my, my lightest day. And then in the mornings before my tutoring kicks off, right, uh, I, I have to attend to uh, managing my other, we have eight tutors on the team, you know, to run the logistics, payroll, make sure everything's good on that front. We we monitor um, the, the, the reports of like what comes in, hey, who have you worked with this and that. And then I'm also making content as well for the YouTube channel. I'm trying to make content every week. And right now we're in the middle of a big project. Uh, part, it's a partnership with OpenStax, which is a nonprofit run by Rice University. So we're making all these math explanation videos for all of high school math right now, Algebra 2 and Trig. So that's a big component of my day to day. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of the, the mixture of, of all the things that I work on now. And, and I love the fact, by the way, I, this might be specific to me, but I will tell you that the fact that I get, I have a, a wide range of things that are part of my duties, the administrative side, not my, not my favorite, but the fact that it's like just there as something different to change up my, my weekly regimen. I kind of like it. Um, the, the content creation, I love making stuff on YouTube. I love dealing with, uh, you know, connecting with people that way and making content that helps people. Um, and then the tutoring and then all these different things, the fact that it's a mixture of tasks, I don't know. I just think for me in particular, and for a lot of people, it keeps it really fun. And the beauty of having your own business is you can sort of like artificially inject that in, you know, yes, people were telling me to, to create social media, but I get to choose what type of social media content I make. So I always try to make stuff that yes, it helps students, but it's also fun for me. And so that keeps it keeps everything running and probably why I can work so much still for this long and still be really in the zone. Right. Now, how many people do you have working for you right now? How many tutors? So I have eight tutors. I have to I think I, I feel like I've, I've got that right. Eight. I can't remember if it's eight or nine, so, but I think it's eight tutors. And then we have uh, uh, then I have my assistant that also works with me in, in office. Uh, my house is my office. So she kind of comes in during the week and she's great. She she helps me so much with with all sorts of things, logistics, uh, um, scheduling, you know, uh, billing. And then she's actually, she can do some video editing now, which is pretty cool. So she's helping me work on that side, especially with our math puzzles, uh, TikTok channel. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, so that so your journey in the last 10 years has literally gone from, you know, jumping on wise and teaching for 16 bucks an hour to now having a full team of eight, nine shooters. Um, I remember you, back in the day, like you were living in like very affordable, you were living very minimalistic, right? You were not mm -hmm. spending any money. You were living yes. in a very small apartment, even, even until like a few years ago, um, yep. you know, and seeing where you're at now with like, I mean, you have an elevator in your house. I mean, <laughs> a lot of people that have an elevator in their house, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. We're, that's so funny. Yeah. It's, it's pretty crazy. Um, the, it's like, Man, it's just such a trip to think about it. Yeah, so you know, I don't like to talk about the the price points too much, but I will. I will mention just so you get a frame of reference. So let's say we're starting at twenty an hour, but sixteen if you really take in the commission into consideration. Um, and I'm going to tell you my price point just, and I want to explain it, okay? Because I price very carefully. I've priced my price point has evolved and changed the way that I wanted it to. Not the way that maybe other people would change their price point. I changed it when I felt like I was comfortable doing so. Meaning, if I'm at eighty dollars an hour, and then now I feel like I've got enough experience, enough, uh, uh, enough basically skill under my belt, where I, I feel like now I'm a hundred dollars an hour tutor. Then that's when I bump my price. When I was comfortable saying it, because I'm like, you know what, I feel like now I've reached that point. Um, and over the years, hundred, hundred twenty, hundred and fifty. This is the actual evolution, 150, um, 200, 250, 300, 400, and now I'm at 500 um, for new clients. I do have legacy rates. Obviously, I want to value loyalty and those families that have stuck with me since the beginning. So there are legacy rates and we have, we have an array. Um, but yeah, for new clients sent for the last year, that's what I charge. And again, 
it's be- there are people that charge more than me, by the way. There are definitely pe- uh, tutors that still charge more than me. But I believe, you know, and I'm not saying this from a – like I'm saying this because I've put in the work. I put in the – I don't know anybody – else who kind of is this obsessive over the field uh, for better or for worse. But I feel like I put in the time and I feel like I am the best. I am the best when it comes to uh, curriculum worth as well as uh, SAT and ACT math coaching. I've got it down. I feel really confident. Uh, and, and then there's also these, these other elements that the connection elements, you know, when, if you talk about what is what are the key comp- I have a video on this by the way, but what are the key components to being a phenomenal tutor? I really do put at the top of that list uh, connection, um, and that means really just does the student like you? Does the student kind of respect what you're telling them and respect you? Uh, and, and, and you get along and you you have fun. We have fun in our sessions, you know, uh, and, and conquering this this thing. So, anyways. That's that's why that's how the price point has changed. But yeah, and then you think about all this stuff too. Uh, and the business has all grown organically, right? So I'm really proud of that. I've never taken fundraising money, and as I built my team of tutors, I've done it gradually. Uh, and this is, I think, extremely extremely important. Okay, if you if you do endeavor to do something like this, if you pick the people correctly, like you picked truly truly phenomenal people, man, it just things kind of work just beautifully. Uh, and I, I don't, I don't take tutors that don't have experience. So I'm, I'm trying to cultivate a team of tutors that are experienced and that are, uh, there's, there's one exception to that. There's one young student that I have that is just, just such a natural affinity for it. And his price point reflects his lack of experience. Right. And I, so I tell people, Hey, you know, he's, but he, I can just, t- I just knew he was one of my students. I just knew he's got that. He's got that star ability to, to teach and connect and communicate. So he's the exception to the rule, but in general, I've been able to pick really, really phenomenal people and then it just works. It's magic. It really is. And why am I able to pick really phenomenal people? I believe it's because, again, I'm not just a business owner. I'm not just a manager. Hey, like this guy seems good on paper, but no, 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 no. I I know what it takes because this is what I do with the vast majority of my time for the last 10 years. So I know how to pick. I know. And, and, and it's sort of, it's grown like that. I'm really proud of that. And then if, if the, the, part about living simply man like i think i do, i feel like that was important for me there was years from basically 2015 until a year and a half ago when i bought this house you know i i shut everything down in my life right 2013 i started and i still was kind of figuring out i didn't know what it was going to take and all this stuff and then i i made a conscious decision 2 years later i was like man my business has barely grown um, it's kind of embarrassing to be honest. And so I was like, okay, I'm shutting everything down. No more going out on the weekends. Uh, I'm going to finally commit and submit to the idea that you should go to bed early and wake up early, all these things. And I, and as I just went into full beast mode, man, almost immediately things started working. Um, and it was, it, 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 really blew my mind. But then I continued to to live very simply because I was like, what's the point of having more than a, a small one bedroom where I, tr- and I had my entire, you saw it, right? I had my entire main area. There was no TV, no couch, no nothing. It was just an office and then my bedroom. And I would wake up and I love, I love that because I was like, right. The first thing I get up and I walk out of my bedroom, I have to work because there's nothing else to do. Uh, and so that period of time was great because it just kept, kept me so focused. And then on top of that, um, when things really started picking up, but that's another thing we can talk about if you like how the, how the pandemic really shifted the business. And at, at that point, that's when the business really, really accelerated, um, to a new level as well. Uh, even though, you know, it was a really sad thing for the world and terrible, but that, that was, is how it impacted my business. Um, and then I continued to live simply even those several years where it was just boom, 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 because I had that objective of, I wanted to get my dream house. Not only that, I wanted to get a space where like my entire bottom floor is the office. And it is because I found the perfect house where it's perfect for somebody like me, where I wanted to run my business out of my home. So it's crazy. Like now I'm, I've got this place, which is still getting used to it, you know, for so many years. Uh, I love that, that simpler living situation, but anyways. So I want to go into the factors that have driven your success. Cause I see, obviously you're doing tutoring 
people that listen mm -hmm. to this podcast doing Airbnb hosting, of course, but there's a lot of similarities, I think, um, <clears throat> to that, that make you successful that are common in any, any type of industry, no matter what you do. Like if you're, if you have your own business, there's a number of things that are going to drive you success. And I want, I want to go into a number of these cause, and I'll tell you what I see, you know, cause I've watched your journey so closely. I'll tell you what I see that I think if, has, you know, has really driven your success. And you, you let me know if you agree, but I would say the first thing, like going back to you, what you were saying, I don't know anybody who, who worked so hard, <laughs> seriously, like it, it was crazy. You know, the amount of hours that you put in is just unbelievable. Um, and so that's, to me, that's an obvious contributor to, to hard work of, uh, to success. It's just plain old hard work. Right. And the sacrifice that comes with it. Right. You know, as you know, when other people are like going out and taking vacations and doing all the stuff, you're there, you know, just cranking out and putting in the hours. Um, so that's one thing, but, you know, I think in order, in order to be able to put in that many hours, I think there's a couple of things that have to be in place. Number one, which you mentioned before is you have to do something that you're really passionate about. You know, you have to do something that you enjoy. And it goes back to, you know, when you were saying like, okay, I got to do social media. Well, let me pick that one thing inside of social media that makes it fun for me, right? Don't try to force something that you really don't like doing because you're not going to be able to, uh, you know, put in those hours and the consistency. And that's, a, that's the second thing, the consistency of, you know, I've watched your YouTube channel. And by the way, if, if you haven't seen uh, Josefa's YouTube channel, he, he makes some amazing music videos about math and with, with the kids. It's super, super fun to watch. So definitely check out Scalar Learning on, on YouTube. Um, but just the consistency of you putting out video after video after video and not really seeing the numbers go up, mm -hmm. but you're still consistently for years just pumping out that content, um, which is, is incredible. So I think, you know, the, the hard work, choosing something fun, the consistency, but then also one aspect that I want to get into that I know is very, um, timely or, or like it's, it's big for you recently in the last few years is in order to put in so many hours, we have to be, we have to be feel energetic and we have to feel, be productive. Right. So tell us a little bit about the changes that you've made when it comes to your lifestyle, uh, when it comes to health when it comes to your mental health and, and all of that, like how are you able to put in so many hours and be so productive? Yeah, man, it's a, it's a multi-step journey to, to figure all this stuff out. Um, but the first thing, the first thing that I did at the beginning, the first massive change and that, man, I'm telling you, it's like, it is almost like the universe said, okay, you've actually made your mind up to work, to put in everything. Now we're going to, now we're going to help you out. Cause it was so weird. It was like, a week and a half after I made up my mind that I'm going to fully submit and just just give everything, that thing started going really well. Like, it was crazy. But anyways, the first thing, and I'm not saying everybody has to necessarily go to these lengths, but I gotta, I kind of feel like if you do commit to just going all in, it's, it's almost like a bit of a cheat code. It's almost like you're probably going to win if you just become almost a little crazy. Uh, in terms of how how hard you work. But anyways, the first thing I did was and and just to give you a little bit of context, right? You might think, "Hey, you're you're just you never like to go out." So, whatever, it's no big deal. You just sit at home, but for somebody like me, I need my time with my friends and you're just different. Well, and yes, we can attest to this. N let me correct you on that. If you look at the, you know, that extrovert scale, I I'm like as high as you can be. I love being around my friends. Socializing and and going to parties and traveling and doing all that stuff was so important to me for so long, really up till 35, to be honest. I'm 40, I just turned 43. And so giving that stuff up was, I thought, impossible, really. I thought it was so ingrained in me and such a such a part of my life. But when I did, and, and it wasn't even hard because I just, I came to a point where I'm like, I'm, this is not working. This is not making me happy anymore. So I'm going to just drop it all. Uh, so that full, fully committing and, and uh, really making it the everything in my life. And, you know, we were doing stuff at, at Get Paid for Your Pad. We were doing the podcast. That's the reason why I stopped being on the podcast, even though it was awesome. And it blew up afterwards, by the way, right? It really blew up. Um, after I jumped off, so maybe that was a good thing, right? But, but anyways, that that was the reason why why I did it because I said I just need I need to be all in on this one thing. I, I don't know why I just had that 
no, I had that feeling that that was how my path to be the best of the best. Um, so that's one thing I can say. And then in terms of working really hard at it, like I said, if all these things you, you start to intrinsically like, like I, I've spoken at a lot of conferences about how to start a math YouTube channel. Okay. And one of the things I tell people is, man, at the beginning, you're not going to see any rewards, right? You asked, how did I make all, I was making so many videos for years. They were just getting no views, but I don't know. Like I, I'd always loved making videos since I was a kid, you know? So it was the, the artistic process of just being like, okay, I got seven views, but man, I'm proud of that. Man, this is really, really, I feel like I, if, if somebody would watch it, they're going to get a lot out of this. It's the music videos, the other videos. So just appreciating the almost like the artistic element of it made it easy. So I had an, I have an idea. I get to do it. I'm going to see it. And wow, that came out how I envisioned it. It was fun. It was exciting. And it was, you know, gave me, just gave me excitement, endorphins. Um so I think that's also really important. That's the beauty of, of having your own business. You can weave these things into it that are intrinsically fun. And man, it just, it really does magic. Now, if we talk about the fitness side and how that's become, you know, I've always been into working out and stuff like that, but my diet has not always been on point. Definitely not. I mean, you know, from me back in the day, I really didn't know anything about nutrition and health. Um, and people always say, I look really young for 43. And I think a part of that is definitely my commitment to fitness and nutrition and whatnot, not just from a physical standpoint. Definitely, we all like to look our best and all that, but man, for mental clarity, for energy, it really makes a difference. So one of the things that I've basically committed to since I turned 40, I would say, uh, but even before then, I was kind of dabbling in this. You know, I've locked in for me. I know there can be a lot of variation for people. So you, you can kind of do some exploration, maybe even some food allergy tests. But I found for me that a paleo diet really makes me feel my best. That combined with intermittent fasting as well. Like it's, you know, 11 o'clock. I don't plan to still eat for another three, four hours. Um, just drinking coffee and lots of water. Um, and I work out every day. Now I know that that might seem excessive for some people, but that's the way I am. I like to make it a daily thing. Not so like, oh, I get to take this day off and then man, I have to go to the gym tomorrow. No. Plus, I don't know what it is about working out, but I love it. So it, or lifting weights in particular, training Muay Thai, that type of stuff. So if you can find those elements, again, just like the entrepreneurial journey, find stuff in terms of exercise that you enjoy. And then it's like, it's, it's dope. It's easy. It's in it. But anyways, all these different components, I think, keep me at that optimal energy level. I, I'm a naturally like happy, excited person, but that keeps it optimized. Another thing recently, this is very recent, and I'm just going to tell people this because at this age of my life, it's, man, it's really, it's really given me a lot of energy and a lot of mental clarity and strength and much better sleep. So I just want to put it out there. Uh, I just quit drinking alcohol uh, for, about four months ago. And I'm not telling you that that's something that you have to give up by any means. I will say I'm, I can say with, with a really, you know, you never know, right? Future is in the future, but I'm pretty positive that I don't think I'll ever have a drink ever again. Um, and not even one just for fun because I just don't see the point anymore. And man, it was doing a number to me that I had no idea. Just even moderate drinking really is disruptive to your sleep. And I think it's more so as you get older. Uh, and that's what I started noticing. I actually did notice something was changing. I didn't even attribute it to the alcohol anyway. So I don't want to harp on that, but, but these are, these are the different things that I'd say kind of keep me in the mix. Plus, uh, well, sorry, one last thing. It's your business. Expl like that you get to be the choice maker. If you think something sounds like a good idea, and even though maybe people may tell you it's not the best idea, but it excites you and you see promise in it and you see that um, even it doesn't go viral or like do all this, but it's going to be a beneficial piece of content for people to consume. I say run with it um, because not only, yeah, there is still a chance that it's going to be do great, but it's not even about that in a lot of ways. It's like it's going to make you feel happy. It's going to make you get up out of bed. It's going to make you feel excited. Why not? That's going to just keep your drive that much higher. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one thing that I like to touch on as well when it comes to the lifestyle changes, like you've mentioned, uh, you know, paleo diet, intermittent fasting, uh, quit drinking alcohol, working out uh, every day. So what about the sort of the mental side of like meditate, meditating, breath work, like that type of stuff? 
That is a, a newer addition to my life, I'd say starting in 2021. It's been something I've been wanting to get involved with. For, I mean, you read all the most successful people in the world meditate and do breath work and you know all these other things. So I've been meaning to, meaning to, and it kind of scared me a little bit because I like I like thinking a lot and having ideas and, you know, you almost become a slave to your mind in some cases. You don't realize it, but when your mind goes like, like mine does sometimes, um, maybe you almost get addicted to that busyness. Um, but then you start seeing all these super successful people meditating and calming their mind, slowing their mind and it having all these potential benefits. So I started getting interested in it. Um, now, for me personally, since I was having trouble sort of doing it independently, I eventually hired a meditation coach. Um, she would work with me via Zoom. Actually, this was still during uh, pandemic time. So she it was perfect. We jump on, we do a meditation Mondays and Fridays. And she, it was a guided thing and started getting into it. Um, now I have an in-person coach in Los Angeles that comes and does the the meditation with me in person, which actually for me... I find that to be, it makes a difference. Okay. I didn't know that, but I try. I was like, let me try it and get, get back into it. Cause I kind of took a little break. Uh, and then I got, I was like, man, okay, this is really, this is really what I need. But anyways, um, the meditation practice. Yeah. I don't know. Like once you get into it, it's a blast. I can't, like, I can't say it's hard for me to say the, the, the direct, um, let's say the direct causal impact on my my mindset and and whatnot. But I got to say, I, I really enjoy it. I value it. I think, I believe it centers me. Um, so it's kind of like a little cherry on top of, of everything else I'm doing. Let's put it like that. Yeah. Is there, is there anything that you feel like has really uh, contributed to your success that we haven't discussed yet? Well, uh, I think another thing is, at the beginning, I really didn't think too much about if I had an opportunity, even if it was free, uh, and like meaning nobody would pay me anything. If I had an opportunity to get hours in and to get work in, I just took it. Um, I there was my one of my first clients was an hour and a half drive away, and hour and a half drive back. So that's three hours of driving. And I would go for like a two hour session or a three hour session. Uh, and this was I was charging them $30 an hour. So let's say I dr I'm driving three hours, and then let's say even a two hour session or a three hour session, let's say at the max for $90 and coming back, so you factor in time, gas money, all that stuff. It really wasn't uh, maybe from an ROI standpoint, people get so obsessed with ROI, ROI, but it's like, but I knew that it was doing something beyond just the, the monetary gain. I was getting better. I'm getting experience. I'm getting the word out. People can know, hey, this guy, he, he came and really had a good connection with my child and helped them and this and that. Maybe you want to try. So I knew there was some intrinsic value to that. And so that was, I think that's something that, like the whole time I viewed this as an art form. I want to be the best at this craft. So put in those reps, put in those hours. So I think having just being humble about like, even if you come from a high paying job, but like get rid of that, get rid of that attitude that, yeah, I used to get paid this much and then I need that to whatever. Like if you can kind of let that go and just take advantage of all these amazing opportunities to cut your teeth. Uh, I think, I think that was really important for me. Yeah. And, and, and now today people keep telling me, and, and maybe there will come a day where I have to reduce the amount of hours I tutor, but there's something to it. You know, the fact that I still to this day put in so much time teaching and tutoring, I know that keeps me on top of my game. Like nobody else is getting that much experience of one-on-one -on -one time with students. I don't believe very few people uh, probably out there that even want to do that. Right. Uh, so, so these types of, and, and look at the message of what I'm saying is so simple. Just work. Just put in the work, do, do put in the hours and magical things will happen. <laughs> really? It's like, it's almost, it's almost like magic. Like you, cause you know, sometimes people look at me from the outside and they're like, oh, you're such a businessman. You, you've got this marketing strategy. You've got this. And I'm like, now nah, you're missing the, the point. I am not like, I actually don't like it when people say that about me because I'm like, you're, you're missing the point. All this stuff has kind of worked out on accident in a way because I wasn't thinking necessarily about how to capture leads or how to do this. I was just just coming from a pure place of like, how do I be the best at this? How do I make the best videos that have the highest teaching value? And when you approach it from from that standpoint, 
you don't have to think so much about these strategies that like some of these accelerators or startup um, training grounds will tell you like, hey, but you need to get think about the customer and think about this and think about them. Just like just simplify everything and be like, how can I help? And like I said, all these things just work themselves out. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's that's one thing that's just consistent over over all industries. I mean, get paid for your pad is an example of that as well. Like when we started this, like I was, we weren't sitting down of like, all right, let's let's uh, come up with this like million dollar marketing strategies and like all this stuff. We were just like, hey, this is fun. Let's let's consistently just do this and share share this with the world. You know, and, and you know when it comes to when it comes to marketing, that's actually a very strong marketing strategy, right? To just literally share with the world. Which is something that it's actually we have that in our in our Legends X program actually that we're teaching our students too of like how do you get more properties? Well, consistently share your story with the world. Try mm -hmm. to be you know the best you can. Try to be the best at what you do and share with the world, whether it's for YouTube or Instagram or meetups or whatever it is. Tell the world about what you're doing, right? And if you do that consistently, then opportunities are going to come your way. You know, your example of reaching out to all these schools, you reached out to 300 schools, right? Five came back and mm -hmm. one meeting in particular, like, was a huge help. That's the same mm -hmm. thing that we see as well in, in our industry too. One of our students, like, reached out to... You know, all these, all these, uh, uh, people that organize like meetups in the real estate space. And suddenly he got one opportunity where he was able to speak in front of 300 people. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's the hustle, you know, you got to put yourself out there, uh, and do that consistently and, and share yourself with the world. So I think that's one, one thing that's just, you know, along all industries, whatever you do, that's always a, a, a powerful strategy to use. And let me I say one ask, of Oh, sorry. Can I, I just want to add on to that one, one really important thing that I do want to put out there is I, I, I want to let the one thing is, especially in my type of industry and services related, I think incorrectly, the vast majority of people right at the beginning, the first question is always, how do I get clients? How do we get a client, a second client, a third client? That should not be the first question. Absolutely. In my humble opinion, but if you're doing this business out of love and you're trying to do it the right way, what should your first question be? It shouldn't be how I get a client because maybe you don't deserve a client right now because maybe you're not good enough yet. So the real question is, how do I get good? Okay. And then all these things, you, you build it around that. Um, and, and then you're getting clients when you deserve them, when you're good enough, when you're help, when you're helpful enough and when you deserve like whatever you, whatever you're charging, you understand? So I think if you make, if you reframe things as, as that's your central question at the very beginning, how do I become excellent at this? It's going to work out. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Like, how do I, how do I get really good at this and how do I bring value? Right. Mm -hmm. And then everything else will, will come back to you. Um, before we, uh, wrap this off wrap this up wrap this up i want to ask you one more question like if there's one if you could go back 10 years what's one thing you would have done differently i don't do anything different no way and i i'm one i'm a person i you know i don't i don't even like to go there mentally because number one what's the you know what's the what, there's that's it i it, i i'm not saying it's a, a bad question by any means but to me I want to look forward. I want to look at things that are um, that I can impact and stuff like that. So I don't know. I, I I'm just not a huge fan of that of that exercise in general. And also, too, man, you change one thing, and then maybe I'm not here where I'm at right now. And and we were talking about this over the weekend, dude. I love my life so much right now, and. I wouldn't have wanted it even in the short term of like, hey, maybe that was a bad decision because it had a, a short term effect that made me sad or something, right? But but look, it all worked. It all worked so beautifully, and you know, some of these experiences that I've had over the years that were tough, I have to believe that they were impactful and helped me going forward. So I wouldn't change one thing. Right. No, that's a great mindset to have of thinking back and saying like, hey, you know what? Everything that happened was part of the journey and it brought me where I am right now. Um, so I love that. Um, before I let you go, tell the audience how they can uh, how they can find you. Yeah, absolutely. So I think our, our biggest social media presence and probably where you can find the most awesome content, especially if you have a, a if you're a student or if you have a, a student that you know or, or whatnot that's interested in SAT, ACT prep. And now uh, we're going to have math for all levels of high school. We're going to have algebra two and trig done by the end of the summer. And then we're going to keep churning them out. This is in, in concert with OpenStax, which is the most amazing collection of totally free online open source textbooks on the planet. 
Uh, so you can check us out on YouTube. Just go to YouTube and uh, uh, type in Scalar Learning, S-C-A-L-A-R Learning. So that's our uh, YouTube channel. And if you have questions about tutoring, you can hit us up at tutoring at scalarlearning.com. Boom. Awesome. Man. Yeah, well, we have, we have, we have you, uh... Instagram. Oh, we, we also have an Instagram page too, uh, around 60,000 followers. So that's like math, infographics, stuff like that. If you want to check that out, hit us up there as well. Oh, can I say one last thing too? The <laughs> channel that I'm so excited about, but it's still growing. It's still it's in, in its infancy. And I say infancy is like almost <laughs> it's getting up to four years old, but we just have barely over a thousand uh, subscribers. So uh, it is what it is, but I truly believe that this channel is fantastic and it's our math puzzles channel. So if you also go, uh, yeah, I'm sure that will be in the description link, you can click on it. But yeah, if you search for math puzzles, Huzefa, you'll you'll find it. And we've got math puzzles that are just fun for all ages, for parents, for adults. Keep your brain active and moving, and they're fun, and they only take a couple of minutes each. So uh, I think we have like uh, over 100 math puzzles up there right now, and we're going to churn a bunch more out this summer. So you can also find me there. Boom. Awesome, man. Well, I appreciate you uh, jumping on here. Uh, again, this was a special uh, episode for my birthday. I thought it'd be fun to uh, to get uh, Huzefa on here, the man behind the famous uh, "Get Paid for Your Path" intro tune uh, that has stuck in so many heads of the of the people who've been listening to this podcast. Um, and last but not least, um, uh, to celebrate my birthday, I uh, I thought I'd do something crazy. I thought I I'd offer a uh, because I turned forty six. I figured it'd be fun to to do a a uh, 46% discount uh, on uh, Legends X. So if, you, uh, if you're if you on our email list, you should have an email with a link if you want to take advantage of that. So you get 46% off. It's pretty cool. Um, this offer is only valid today, expires today. So if you're listening to this uh, uh, and you want to take advantage of it, just email me, uh, team at overnightsuccess.io, team at overnightsuccess.io, and I'll send you out the details. But if you're on our email list, you should already have a, a number of emails with the links and stuff. So um, with that said, I'm uh, going to wrap up this episode. Zephyr, thanks again. And to all the listeners, I hope you uh, found this uh, episode inspiring, a little different from uh, what we usually do, of course. But, you know, it's been, uh, been so incredible to see uh, to see Zephyr, like, be so successful. And, is, you know, if anybody deserves it, it's him because the amount of work he's put in is uh, is incredible. So congrats, dude. Um, it's been amazing. Thank you for all the, to all the listeners. And we'll be back on Friday with another episode. Later.